While fighting in the streets of the Russian capital in the midst of the revolution, the heroes of Mother Russia Bleeds pass by some onlookers wearing rubber animal masks that stick out like a sore thumb. Of course, for anyone that's played Hotline Miami 2, this group of people are an obvious reference to the fans, characters that are a big part of the story in that game, and their appearance in Mother Russia Bleeds is meant to just be a fun little nod to it. However, their presence also gives rise to the question of whether Hotline Miami and Mother Russia Bleeds are in the same universe. A ridiculous thought at first. Of course they don't share a universe. But when you take a step back and look at other facets of the worlds of the respective games, some things begin to line up and suggest there could be a connection there after all. Let's look at some of these details and see if the worlds of Mother Russia Bleeds and Hotline Miami are one and the same. Before we get into things though, let's start with a high level overview of the stories of each game so that the details are fresh in our heads. Mother Russia Bleeds takes place in Russia in March of 1986. The state of the country leaves a lot to be desired for most of the populace, as while they live in destitution, a select few members of society live in extravagance and comfort. This is because most of the wealth of the country is controlled by this wealthy elite, most of whom are either members of or have connections to the Bratva, also known as the Russian Mafia, who are perpetuating the oligarchy of Russian society so they can stay at the top, even if it means it could destroy the country. The Bratva have also corrupted the government of Russia by getting politicians to work for them, further cementing their position at the top. One of the things the Bratva does to fill their pockets is use funding from the government to secretly develop a drug that they call Necro and flood the streets with it. Necro is highly addictive and cheap to produce, meaning it's highly profitable for the Bratva. However, it also has devastating side effects to its users, but the Bratva don't care about the human cost of necro use at all. They're only concerned with getting money from its users to fill their treasure vaults with. The four main characters of the game are kidnapped by the government slash Bratva and used as test subjects for necro. They eventually break out of their confinement and help a man named Vlad stage a revolution whereupon they overthrow the corrupt government of Russia, oust the Bratva, and save the country. Hotline Miami, on the other hand, begins in Hawaii in 1985, where Russia and the United States are at war. The war comes to an end in April of 1986 after Russia launches a nuke on San Francisco, an attack that leads to America's defeat. After this event, a coalition is set up between the countries, appropriately named the Russo-American Coalition, to prevent another tragedy like San Francisco from happening again, and prevent the outbreak of another war. But the American populace is incredibly upset at their loss in the war and the country's conciliatory tone in the coalition, so they harbor a hatred for Russia and its people. As the years pass, the American people begin to notice Russian immigrants taking root in their communities. Immigrants that have ties to criminal organizations and seem involved in activities that are flooding their communities with crime. When they wonder why nothing is being done about this, they notice the immigrants are also close to the politicians involved in the Russo-American coalition, suggesting the coalition may not be as noble as it seems, and is protecting these Russian immigrants. As a result, the anti-Russian sentiments they harbor begin to grow. Eventually, a patriotic organization named 50 Blessings, upset at the state of America following the Russo-American War, decides to do something about it. In the spring and summer of 1989, they begin leaving threatening messages on the answering machines of their members, coercing them to harass and eventually kill Russians while wearing rubber animal masks. 
their goal is twofold. They want to weaken the Russo-American coalition by exposing its criminal connections and assassinating its corrupt politicians, and give the impression that Americans are sick of the Russians that are ruining their country and are finally standing up to them. These actions will stoke the flames of anti-Russian sentiments that are growing in America, which 50 Blessings plans to use to get power power they intend to use to fix the country. Their plan actually works, and after one of their agents is arrested after killing corrupt politicians and eliminating the Russian Mafia in Miami in 1989, the American populace expresses support for him and his supposed cause. As a result, 50 Blessings stops the attacks and bide their time. Watching the anti-Russian sentiments grow more and more over the course of two years. And finally, in 1991, when the relations between the two countries is at its weakest and American nationalism is at its peak, the organization makes its move and stages a takeover of the American government, killing the presidents of both America and Russia and taking a stance against Russia. This coup is seen as an act of war by Russia, who retaliates by launching nukes at America, which likely results in a retaliatory strike of its own, leading to the destruction of both countries and presumably the rest of the world. So how could these two games be tied together? Well, let's start with the thing that suggested the idea in the first place, the fans being present in the Russian capital during the Russian Revolution in March of 1986. Could these characters have actually been there? Well, probably not. While they were soldiers that fought in Hawaii during the Russo-American War, it's unlikely that the war would have reached Russian territory, since the impression given by the commanding officer of the American forces in Hawaii was that America was losing in that arena, meaning they wouldn't be able to advance past it. Could the fans have been part of a special forces unit that was sent to help the revolution? That's unlikely as well, as the implication given by Hotline Miami 2 is that the fans weren't very good fighters when they were enlisted, being part of D Company, a unit that struggled to capture a Russian stronghold in Hawaii. The fact that they weren't engaged to participate in the attacks on Russians in 1989 further reinforces the idea that they weren't especially good fighters, something that they did eventually fix in 1991. Additionally, the outfits they're wearing are totally out of place with the timeline. They're each wearing the makeshift combat outfits they fashioned for themselves in 1991, five years after the start of the revolution. Even the rubber animal masks are out of place, as 50 Blessings wouldn't issue those to their members until three years after the revolution. With all of this in mind, it seems unlikely that the fans are the thing tying the two games together. So if it's not the fans that ties the games together, what exactly does? Well, the biggest connection comes from the main antagonists of each game, the Bratva and Mother Russia Bleeds and the Russian Mafia in Hotline Miami. Could these two organizations be the same one? The easiest thing to note is that the word Bratva literally refers to the Russian Mafia, so it just makes sense. But it goes deeper than that. It's known that after the bombing of San Francisco and the signing of the Russo-American Coalition, Russian immigrants began moving to America, ones that had associations with the Russian Mafia. What could have prompted this sudden migration of the Bratva? Well, what about a revolution that removed them from power and ousted them from the country? Maybe, after their defeat in the motherland, they decided to move to America and try their luck in the land of opportunity. In fact, the more you compare the Bratva from Mother Russia Bleeds and the Russian Mafia from Hotline Miami, the more things begin to line up. For instance, in Hotline Miami, there are three characters that lead the Russian Mafia. The first is a man with long black hair, the second is his son, who is a spitting image of his father, save for some scars he bears across his face. And the last is the patriarch of the organization, 
an old bald man bound to a wheelchair, who presumably was the one who taught the other two how to run the whole thing. These characters, nicknamed father, son, and grandfather respectively, bear a striking resemblance to some of the portraits seen in the halls of the Russian government headquarters by the heroes of Mother Russia Bleeds. It's quite possible these paintings could depict one of son, father, or grandfather before they and the Bratva were ousted by the revolution. And just like their days in Mother Russia when they lived in luxury and comfort, surrounded by lavish decorations and holding their money in treasure vaults of gold, the Russian Mafia in America lives in extravagance, residing in a gaudy mansion filled with nice cars and bubbling fountains, and even keeping exotic animals as pets. Sun's preferred pet is seen in his office in 1991, where he keeps a shark in a large aquarium in his office. A pet he may have been inspired to get from his time spent in Russia in his youth, as there is a similar aquarium seen in Mother Russia Bleeds in the halls of the government headquarters in 1986. The Bratva was able to afford luxuries like this shark tank, thanks to the favorable treatment they got from the government. Of course, the reason they were treated so favorably was because they actually blackmailed politicians into working for them, and used the influence they had over these politicians to enrich themselves and push their interests. Likewise, in Hotline Miami, the Russian Mafia has political connections that they use to benefit themselves. Their connections to some of the politicians associated with the Russo-American coalition has granted them the ability to expand their operations in Miami with little repercussions, a behavior they likely learned from their days in Russia. And it's quite possible that political manipulation wasn't the only thing the Russian Mafia brought forward from its past. After the attacks by mass assailants in 1989, the Russian Mafia was nearly wiped out. Father and grandfather were killed, and their criminal operations were nearly destroyed. Leadership of the organization fell onto Sun, and in 1991, he came up with a plan to restore the Russian Mafia to its former glory. One part of his plan was to re-establish their presence in the drug trade, which Sun planned to accomplish by introducing a newly developed drug to the market, one encased in a green and purple pill. When a user takes the drug, they can go into a frenzy and tear through multiple enemies with ease, while also growing numb to physical pain inflicted on their bodies. However, they also experience intense hallucinations, making them lose their sense of reality. These effects, while a little different, sound pretty similar to the effects of another drug associated with the Russian Mafia. One developed in secret back when they were at the top of Russian society. Maybe instead of risking the development of an entirely new drug with new chemicals and compounds, one that could be costly and may not end up being as effective as he needed, Sun used the Russian Mafia's previous drug, Necro, as a baseline for the development of this new drug, since he already knew that Necro was cheap to produce and highly addictive, meaning it would be very profitable for him and his organization if they could recreate it. Maybe in an effort to stave off the more devastating side effects, like people turning into mutants, he decided to make the drug ingestible instead of injectable, a process that tweaked some of the effects of the drug, but made it safer to use and more likely to be used for longer, thereby ensuring they would have a customer base that wouldn't dwindle. Even the color of the new drug could be due to Necro's influence, as Necro had a bright green color when developed by the Bratva in Russia. And maybe when Sun's new drug was created, it kept Necro's glow. And when the drug was placed into its capsules, Necro's color shone through parts of the container, giving Sun's new drug its trademark green look. 
All of this makes a really compelling case that the Bratva from Mother Russia Bleeds and the Russian Mafia from Hotline Miami are the thing that connects the games together, thus making for a shared universe. But ultimately, there's no way to know for certain whether that's the case. And unfortunately, it's more likely that they're not in a shared universe, due to the monumental world events that happen in both games that aren't referenced in either. Still, it's fun to speculate on theories like this, and if you have any connections or ideas of your own that you'd like to share, feel free to. It'd be great to read them. Likewise, if you have any questions or anything, feel free to ask and I'll do my best to answer them. But that finishes things up for this one, so thank you for watching and see you later.